Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 65th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Today is another very special episode because I am joined by Mr. J.P. Sears. Does that name sound familiar? Well, you've probably run across some of his satirical videos online. He is the creator of the Ultra Spiritual Life videos, which if you haven't seen them yet, do yourself a favor, go to YouTube and have a good laugh. But it turns out he's actually not just a comedian and a satirist, he's actually got a bunch of serious spiritual work out there. In fact, his satire is satirizing some of his own beliefs. He's a really interesting guy and I'm stoked that he agreed to come on the show to talk to me about his worldview. This is also a special episode because you can watch it on YouTube. So if you want to see our pretty faces, head over to youtube.com slash Steve Patterson and you can watch us talk. I don't wanna give away too much of our conversation, so let me tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Praxis. More and more people are realizing that college is not what it's cracked up to be. The college experience for many people is a gigantic waste of time. The ideas that you learn in college are shallow and superficial, and you can go into much greater depth just by having a curiosity about a subject and access to the internet. And that degree itself doesn't do what we were all told it would do. It does not guarantee you a job, and fortunately, it does not guarantee you respect. Many people, if not most people, who are graduating college are graduating without any employable skills, not to mention five or six figures of debt. Fortunately, there is an alternative, and it is the company Praxis. Praxis is an apprenticeship program where you not only get real-world job training, you get real-world job experience, and at the end of the program, you get a real-world job. Not only that, but the cost of the Praxis program is less than the money that you make at your paid apprenticeship. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, go to steve-patterson.com slash praxis. So I hope you enjoy my serious conversation with J.P. Sears. Make sure to check him out on YouTube at Awaken with J.P. And check out his new book he just released called How to Be Ultra Spiritual, 12 and a Half Steps to Spiritual Superiority. If you notice the birds chirping in the background, that's because JP was in Costa Rica when we spoke, and I happened to be in Panama at the time. So, Mr. JP Sears, thank you so much for coming on Patterson Pursuit. It is a pleasure to have you on the show, both as a fan, as somebody uh, that's also intrigued by your work a great deal. Oh, thank you, Steve. I'm honored to be on your show, brother. So, you have kind of had a meteoric rise to internet fame just in the last few years. You've got this series called The Ultra Spiritual Life, where you satirize, um, let's say, the kind of the new age movement, the, mm -hmm. the stereotype of the yoga pants wearing, quinoa eating, um, person talking about the colors of their chakras type thing. And uh, it, it's really hit a niche. I think that, I think those beliefs are well overdue for satire, um, mm -hmm. but you, I was going down the rabbit hole of enjoying these videos, and I also saw on your YouTube channel that you have a bunch of serious videos. In addition yeah. to the satire, you are, is it, would it be fair to say you're kind of a life coach? Yeah, that would be fair, fair to say. I've, for the past 15 years, earned my living doing you know, what I would call emotional healing coaching, which is you know kind of like a specific thread in the life coaching umbrella. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's been my background and, you know, the sincere videos on my YouTube channel, I think there's maybe around 150 or so. So yeah, there's definitely, um, that, uh, element along with the satire element. I've noticed too, some of your commenters take your serious videos as if they're also satire. So <laughs> I, I think part of the reason is because the delivery is pretty much identical when you're doing these satirical yeah. videos you deliver things in the exact same way as you deliver the serious content and so but the actual what you're saying is totally different one is obviously satire and the other the others are rather good advice so i think a lot of people are confused they think that your whole thing is just shtick because you deliver it kind of the same way 
<laughs> I know, and I'm laughing right now. So apparently that amuses me. <laughs> and there's a part of me that's amused when people are confused. Uh, it's it's kind of like, you know, I, I'm, why don't I just be me? And right. sometimes I'm sincere, sometimes I'm satirical, and sometimes like I'm both. Uh, but typically when I'm doing videos, it's like I'm going to be one or the other, right. you know, a live video, a live interview, a live audience interaction. Now I might be more dynamic and oscillating mm -hmm. between the two. But yeah, and I totally get the confusion because my delivery, like the, the comedy I do, it's typically straight face, dry humor, right. satire. So in other words, like I, I, I look serious. Yeah. And that's just the way I deliver it. So I guess that uh, the confusion is understandable. Right. I apologize, world. But I'm not really sorry. <laughs> so what I want to get into uh, with this conversation is exploring your actual ideas. Um, yeah. So because it sounds like from what I've gathered, it sounds like your worldview might actually overlap with the worldview that you're satirizing. It sounds like, mm, yeah. in addition to the ultra spiritual um, kind of mockery, you do have maybe should I, I don't want to speak for you, but beliefs that spirituality is actually a real thing. It's not just something that's silly and to be mocked. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For me, my you know spiritual life, and I know that's a super abstract term, uh, yet I'll use it anyway. My spiritual life, my healing, my growth is incredibly important to me, and and I, I think it's uh, a huge uh, deliverer deliverer of meaningfulness in my life. So I do believe, it, at least for me, it's important to not take myself too seriously. Mm -hmm. For me to have my beliefs, but not believe my beliefs. For me to have things that are very important to me, but also challenge myself to see the shadow side of how I navigate those important things and call myself out on what's my ego's agenda mm. and these things that are important to me. And I was finding for you know a good solid 10 years in the beginning of my journey, if you will, like all my spiritual practices, spiritual beliefs, they were like really awesome hiding spots for my ego's agenda. Like I wasn't open-minded enough to question like, am I being egotistical here? Am I using this as a way of self-righteous control? Like, I wouldn't question it because, like, I just looked at, like, this is spiritual. Let that be a trump card. Like, you can't question that. Yeah. Like, there's no way. Like, I'll be offended if I question that. But then I realized, like, yeah, no, I'm a human being. Uh, of course I have, like, really egotistical stuff going on. And of course, I hide it behind an altruistic hiding spot so that I hopefully won't see it. Wow. But luckily, I've I've learned to see at least some of it. And and calling myself out on video is a large part of uh, you know, where the video content comes from. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of ideas packed into there. Um, I like what you said. You're you're hiding your ego behind altruism. So yeah, I, I do want to get into that. Um, but before we get into what the, what you mean by that, would you say that your beliefs are influenced or akin to Buddhist, traditional Buddhist thinking? The, um, definitely. I mean, there's definitely some carryover. You know, I've never like formally studied Buddhism. Like I'll have a book of like quotes it's like that, okay. which is really shallow study. And I look at Buddhist quotes occasionally. So, but to me, the ideas of non-attachment mm -hmm. are huge. And, and I think that we can attribute that to Buddhism. So I'm definitely not like a perfect fit Buddhist, but mm -hmm. there's probably more than any other one philosophy. Uh, I probably take more from Buddhism than mm -hmm. any one philosophy. So a lot of times, um, traditional religion, whether it's if you want to call Buddhism a religion, just for these purposes, let's call it a religion. That's often how it's categorized. Um, Islam, a lot of these philosophies are dismissed immediately as being kind of vacuous and anti-intellectual and there's just a bunch of garbage. Yeah. Um, I think that's a shame. I think there's a great deal of truth to be found if you can pick it out from kind of the bullshit. There's a lot of, sure. yeah, there's a lot of nonsense in religion and that's true. 
but I think too many people throw out the baby with the bathwater. So, yeah. and, and uh, I get this is the same, uh, this somewhat goes on with people who are probably really big fans of your videos. They think what you're doing is satiri satirizing, criticizing, and mocking all religious or spiritual claims kind of as a blanket thing when I, th this is clearly not what you're doing. Yeah, you know, it, and I realize uh, everybody needs to have their own interpretation, of, you know, of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. you, you look at a piece of art in an art gallery, and if there's 20 people looking at it, you're going to have tr 20 different interpretations. So, like, right. I, I don't at all want to be a dictator and, like, right. just, like, you know, uh, demand people see things the way I see them and the way I intend for them to be seen. But yeah, with that said, um, the the idea of realizing there's a lot of dogma and just crap in in anything, I think is is respectful as disrespectful as that sounds. I yeah. think it's disrespectful to our human intelligence to pretend that this something is going to be the end all be all. And I think that's why a lot of people get turned off by religion you know like i do because it to me it's like eh, we're smarter than just to believe this is the only answer but it's just right. like a farm like if you go to a farm and you start picking nourishing vegetables from the ground you realize there is so much dirt that you're not scooping up mm. but you're picking the good things you're which is just a very small surface area when you do the math but you pick the good things. And I think we can do that with really any kind of philosophy. Acknowledge there's a lot of dirt you don't want to consume. Yeah. Like, let's just acknowledge that. The dirt of dogma, let's leave that behind. But if there's gems that are actually going to nourish your life, then I think we can pick that. So by no means uh, do I intend to be disrespectful to right. anything I satirize. Uh, I uh, typically actually only do parody videos on things that I have a high amount of respect for. And I think part of respect for anything is seeing the whole picture, not just the light uh, fairy tale side, but right. also like, yeah, what's the underbelly? Right. Uh, you've got a video called how to, how to become gluten intolerant, mm -hmm. um, which is funny and captures, I think some of the pretense uh, of people who go around being proud of their, you know, being gluten intolerant. Um, but on the flip side, I'm curious, is that something, is that one of those ideas you respect? Because I, I try to avoid gluten because I yeah. experimented and had a good, you know, reaction. Is that also something you've done? Yeah, yeah. I've been gluten free for <laughs> about 16 years or so. Wow. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, <laughs> you know it, it makes a difference in my life uh, to stay away from gluten. And so, yeah, for sure. It's like everything in that video, like that was me, those self-righteous controlling behaviors. Like I'd go home, visit my family and like, how dare you have <laughs> gluten on the table? Right. And then after a while of doing that, I'm realizing like I'm not being gluten free. I'm being a jerk. So being a jerk is different than being gluten free. So, you know, in the video, how to become gluten intolerant, I'm separating the behaviors from the practice. It's right. like it, it, it's the video isn't really about being gluten free. Right. It's about self-righteous human behavior right. that uh, tends to follow people wherever we go. But again, one of my dilemmas that uh, has challenged me is I hide my self-righteous, like just judgmental crappiness. Uh, behind freaking wasp is chasing me. Welcome to Costa Rica. I, I hide it behind altruistic um, hiding spots. Like, okay, I'm doing this for my health. And I really hope I don't get stung here on this uh, call. So yeah, you know, I, gluten. Mm, I definitely lost myself. <laughs> That's there, all right. Uh, uh, being the control freak while believing, no, I'm just being gluten intolerant. So is that kind of where the um, a lot of these videos come from is identifying self-righteousness in, in your own belief system that you think, you know, this, I, I have gained a perspective on myself. This is a really ugly part of me. I need to mock it. I need to, I need to make myself feel uncomfortable about how silly I've, I've been. Yeah, yeah. I would call it an exercise of self-awareness. You know, the 
the self-righteous, controlling, judgmental attitudes, I'm better than you kind of egotistical stuff. I, I think that's that's going to be a part of at least my human nature, period. But the question is, when I try to hide it, or the question is, am I trying to hide it? When I'm trying to hide it, it means I'm not being transparent, I'm not being vulnerable, I'm not being authentic, I'm being mm. fake. And I think when we try to hide things about ourselves, you know, it makes it like it makes it makes it hidden. So what we don't know about ourselves, in my opinion, tends to control us. Mm. And I think that creates a lot of chaos. But when we can be much more honest and transparent with our call it human flaws, uh, I think our flaws work against us less when we're just like open and honest and aware of them rather than pretending they're not there and then they start to really control us. Mm -hmm. So it's really like shining the light of awareness on my uh, what I judge to be my human flaws. So I've just started getting into um, meditation and this sounds like kind of a great deal of what some of the practices is self-awareness, just being aware of what's going on in your own head, both how people um, perceive you and what your how perceptions are being represented to your consciousness and just being aware of kind of what's going on upstairs. And I wonder, are what are your beliefs about awareness in general and kind of consciousness or what, what actually it is to be human? We talk about, you know, human self-awareness, but if we can get into those ideas, what do you think actually it is? Like, I'm confused about what I am. I don't, I don't actually know what I, I seem to be like a point of consciousness, a point of awareness, but I also seem to have this body and it's really confusing. So what are your beliefs on this? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think being ourself it has nothing to do with uh, knowing ourself. You know, being able to intellectually understand what mm. we are is very different than just being what we are. And and personally, I, like mm. I have a lot of respect for the mind. Like, thank God I have one. At least I think I have one. <laughs> and I think Einstein said it best: the mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. But when we try, when we put it in the position of being a master. We can limit ourselves on how much we're living, how much we're actually giving ourselves permission to be ourselves because we have this governor. Like, I'm not going to let myself be myself hmm. any more than the degree in which I intellectually understand who I am, what I am, what is a human being. Well, a human being is probably something more than just this one little speck of the human being called our mind can comprehend. So, hmm. uh, you know, I... I definitely don't know, like, what is a human being? Like, I don't know. Uh, but what a human being is, is probably best comprehended by being a human, not thinking about a, uh, what a human is. So you, in my, I don't know, interactions with life, uh, finding peace, growth, spirituality, uh, I don't invest much time in what I would call intellectual spirituality. Uh, that to me, intellectual spirituality is not spirituality. It, it's intellectualism, which is fine, but I think we we owe it to ourselves to not confuse the two. Hmm. Uh, it, like for instance, like I love to. I don't. Well, I'll put it this way: I don't like to make decisions based on what I think. Hmm. Uh, I don't like to live in my head because I've done so damn much of that. I've lived in my head for so long because that's how I escaped my, my emotions. Like I disconnected them and would just try to make sense uh, out of life through my head. So I like to have my intellectual part as a servant uh, while making, you know, actually living uh, in feeling more the master. So mm. Steve, I think at this point I've absolutely not answered your question, no, but I've definitely yeah. rambled a little bit, <laughs> no, which I that feel is, good about. <laughs> that's a very interesting answer, and it's it's very appropriate just for me personally because I'm definitely stuck in the intellectualizing and over intellectualizing everything. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard for me to go out and be a human unless I know what I am, which which does yeah. seem kind of odd. But uh, several years ago, I had an experience which kind of opened my mind or or taught me something that's very similar to what you've just said when i experienced love for for the woman who's now my wife i thought okay this is a totally different 
ball game. I was doing the the rationalizing, kind of disconnected from my feelings, not in a dep- not in like a depressive way, but just in like, well, my feelings aren't serving my purpose of discovering truth. Like I want to figure out what it is. But then I bumped into this love experience, and it was like, okay, this is this is truth that I've kind of experienced. I can't fully wrap my head around it, but I hard to explain, but I kind of know it's true. Um, which is sure, is sure to upset people in my audience when I say, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it was a good, good. I think if you just told people everything they want to hear, they would not have any benefit from it. They, right. they do, they'd be comforted, but it wouldn't be challenged to consider different perspectives. Hmm. There's a, a, a research institute, I believe they're called the Hartnath Institute. And based on like a study that I didn't even read this study it shows how intellectual I am. I just heard other people talking about this study. So just full <laughs> transparency there. So allegedly they've done research that shows the electromagnetic field of the heart is 5,000 times stronger than the electromagnetic field of the brain. Hmm. So if we just kind of take that at face value, which I know really oversimplifies it, but so if at face value, if we just pretend the heart is 5,000 times more powerful, it gives us a 5,000 5,000 times greater experience of life than the head, then we, then it kind of makes sense. Like the living from our head, it's very finite. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can only comprehend uh, what the head can comprehend, even Mm -hmm. though we try, we think we can comprehend what's beyond the head. And I think that's incredibly, uh, arrogant of our beady little minds. So anyway, that, that's something like I really can consider. I think our feelings give us so much more enrichment than our thinking. And again, I have so much respect for our thinking. Thank God we think it's important. But I think thinking, or I'm sorry, I think feeling, which is ironic, like I think feeling, eh, whatever. <laughs> uh, I think our feelings are a language that's so wise that it can't com- be comprehended through mm. our English language or mm. any other intellectual language. So I think living in our heart at times, feeling our feelings, experiencing the rapture of life that we can't really comprehend with our thinking, things called love things called connection is important. I, and like, yeah, let's try to comprehend things we can comprehend, but surrender to things that we can't comprehend. Now, is there a, um, a boundary somewhere where you think that can be taken too far? Cause I know just people that I've interacted with, it seems like there is an abandonment to feeling that can sometimes go really awry. And then people are kind of wrecks because they yeah. don't, they're not, they're not like mentally stable, I guess. Yeah, this is one way to put it. So how do you how do you play that line of let's surrender to our feelings, but kind of keep them in check? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, to me, the goal isn't to be at one extreme of like, I'm always consumed by my feelings, or to be at the other extreme where I'm only stuck in my head, and I have no connection to my feelings. But to me, the space in between kind of like the Buddhist middle way is the ideal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, I think always being in our feelings all exclusively means we're pretty freaking ungrounded. Mm. Like, let's realize, like, we've we've got this faculty called our mind probably for a reason. It's probably mm. meant to be used. It's probably <laughs> not meant to be used 100 percent of the time to the exclusion of all other aspects of our wise human self. But, yes, yeah, for sure, it can be taken out of balance to the extremes. No question. OK, so. I also, not only am I going to get an interview, I also want to get some life coaching here because when you when you say this, now I have questions for you. Um, how do you live more that way? Um, uh, so if somebody has a has a, a stop, like the the mind is the governor, right, and yeah. is putting a stop on action until you get the comprehension before the action. How do you overcome that? Uh, I, so, so as profound as this love experience was, I found for a while, I still struggle with this, it's almost like an intellectual arrow in my quiver. It's like, oh, I just discovered what I think is the meaning of life. Isn't that nice? And then I, <laughs> I forget about it, which seems kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely don't have all the answers. I probably don't have any of the answers. Yet a, a consideration on... Uh, 
uh, integrating more into our feelings, which I would equate more into our heart as well, is paying attention to our body sensations. Now, I'm not even talking about emotions, which is like cool to pay attention to, but I'm talking about like the feeling sensations that come up in our bodies hmm. that make no intellectual sense. Because I mean, you know, feelings are something like a, a dog with an IQ of 12. It can comprehend, like if it feels tingly, like it, 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 no, it comprehends that, like tingly, got it. It's like a no-brainer, literally a no-brainer. It's an all-feeler. <laughs> so I think regularly practicing the art of paying attention to our body sensations. You know, I, I was you know looking at some comments on a video this morning that re really offended some people, and like, wow, I was feeling like like tightness in my neck hmm. and like tingling in my rib cage, and and I wanted to intellectualize it because like it feels safer to not feel things that are uncomfortable. So I wanted to just comprehend like, Oh, well, people didn't understand my intention of this video. And it's like, no, I got to be into the feelings. I, I can't just run away from these feelings hmm. that doesn't make them go away. Uh, otherwise it's just like I'm on the treadmill and I'm running faster and faster. So long story short, regularly paying attention to the very, simple body sensations that come up uh, in us is something I highly value. Now, how do you keep that open and kind of soft-hearted and feeling when you're an internet personality? The internet is filled with knives and sharp objects that oh, are designed yeah. to hurt you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Normally, I don't keep it open with okay. the uh, uh, video because you, know, you, you get a million people watching a video, you realize... You, there are some people that are connoisseurs of outrage. They're mm -hmm. just, they're looking for things to get offended about. Yeah. Um, but it, it so happens to be that, uh, was it two days ago, I published a video called Welcome to Costa Rica. I'm curious, did you by chance see it? I saw the title. I didn't see the video though. So it, it was my like American uh, take on how Americans view in a very arrogant way Costa Rica. And uh, it, it amused me. And uh, the uh, first time it's ever happened to me where a, an overwhelming number of people felt very disrespected by the video. Really? And, and what really actually hurt me was a lot of Costa Ricans mm. were feeling hurt by the video, mm. which was the last thing I wanted to do. And, and so kind of go into JP therapy hour here. <laughs> uh, what, what I didn't realize was here I am, a dude from the first world, uh, talking, of, like making fun of first world perspectives mm -hmm. in a second world country. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it actually, I mean, it's, it, it really got me my attention when I realized uh, a lot, not everybody, but a lot of people, more than I'm comfortable with, are seeing this video in a much different way than I intended. Hmm. So, so in other words, like I was really paying attention to like, what's the feedback of this? Because hmm. I always want to help people not hurt people. And wow, a lot of people seem hurt by this. So I actually deleted the video this morning, but that that's the reason why I was paying attention to like the comment sections and like hmm. feeling my feelings on this video. But like, that's actually the first time that's ever happened. So mm -hmm. most of the time to, to 20 minute answer to your question, most of the time, I think as a, you know, someone who's publishing uh, work and what I would consider my art online, it's mostly advantageous to not pay attention to the right. inevitable shallow criticism that comes in from haters. Right. But it just so happens like this is like kind of more the exception than the rule. Uh, I mean, this wasn't like hater comments. It was like oh, human beings educating me on how they perceive this video. So my disposition is to not take that approach. I wish I love that approach. Like that strikes me as soft hearted and kind. My approach is to say, hey, if you're offended by this, that's your problem. Yeah. So and, that, and I don't know if that's like anger or, or callousness or something in here. But how do you surely you have that that um, 
thought somewhere, right? Like if you've got offended by a work of satire, that's not my issue. Right? Yeah, for in most of the time, that's my stance yeah. because I I know my intention of a video, and normally my videos come across pretty much the way I intended, aside from the. Uh, you know, online haters and uh, people who feel insecure about what I'm talking about and therefore mm. get offended because uh, they're trying to deflect from their insecurity. Mm. But this was just different. It, okay. it was where it, I felt like if I stood the ground of like, well, you just don't get it or if you need to be offended, I feel like that would be me staying mm. in a posture of arrogance okay. of uh, you're seeing this video wrong. But I think I, I needed to realize like I was wrong, in, not not wrong for making the video, but I was wrong in how I thought the video was going to come across. Mm. So definitely took a, a tablespoon of humbleness for me. Okay. So why, why is it that you care about being nice? Um, yeah. That's a kind of, kind of a blunt question. Why do you care about yeah. how people feel? So, uh, yeah. Is yeah, that... you, it, it um, non-intellectual answer kind of, it's like the theme <laughs> of our yeah, conversation, <laughs> intellectual or not. But really, the, the, it, it feels better to me mm. to be nice. It feels mm. better living inside of my own skin. Mm. Um, being nice, being nice, not people pleasing, not playing it safe, not restricting my points of view that will challenge people, but coming across with good intentions is very important to me. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so uh, like, and, and actually it makes intellectual sense to me about like, it feels better to me, like being nice and caring to people, which mm. honestly, like, that's like selfish. But it's like, yeah, that's, it's like a selfishness I'm okay with. Like, I, yeah, yeah. I feel better being nice to you. It's kind of like the deal. I think that's awesome. I think that's super honest. Um, do you think that uh, altruism in general works this way? That, and there's a, there's a whole school of thought that thinks precisely that, that altruism is great and it's important. We want to show love and kindness because it is like a practice of self-love and it will make you feel better. Yeah. Yeah, I I use <laughs> I think it'd be awesome if we could uh, just be altruistic and not have a self-serving agenda. But I think there's a self-serving agenda to altruism. Like it hmm. it gratifies us, and thank God it gratifies us. Yeah. yeah or else, like I, I don't know that we would have as much kindness happening in the world if it didn't feel kind to ourselves to be kind to others. So I don't want to demonize the, the selfishness with altruism. I want to praise it. Like, thank God that happens. Mm. Uh, but I also want to not pretend that it's not there. It's like, no, no, I, ju I just need you to believe like I'm just super awesome. And like, <laughs> I get no gratification from helping other people. No, it feels awesome to me. So <laughs> let's not delude ourselves there. Well, for, for what it's worth, I think it's awesome um, that you have the honesty to say that uh, and the self-awareness because I think that is behind a great deal of um, hum almost per perhaps even all of human action is mixed with this little bit of self-interest that I think is totally fine. It gets a bad rap. Yeah, well, I appreciate you pointing that out. And like, why not gratify ourselves through altruism rather than grat gratifying ourselves through bullying? Like, right. There's a reason why people bully and are mean to each other and mm. violent towards each other. It's because that makes them feel good. It gives them a temporary sense of power mm. uh, through having a sense of control over someone. So if that's how we're gratifying ourselves, like, Ew, no, mm. thank you. It's pretty destructive if you mm. ask me. So why not gratify ourselves in a way that actually benefits someone else mm. and benefits us at the same time? I, my wife helps me a lot with this because I waffle between when I see bullies and jerks, I waffle between like I want to smash them, like I think it's awful, and then occasionally, especially when my wife helps me with this, um, I feel pity because it's like that person on the inside has to be a wreck in order to be such an incredible jerk. Like you, you got to feel, be feeling terrible. And then I read a little more of what they say and I think, oh, no, screw them. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I think bottom line, if, if someone's bullying someone else, they're a very hurt person trying to hurt another person. And it, I think it gives the bully the illusion, like, I, I'm not hurt anymore because you're the hurt one. So let me hurt you so I can make you the hurt one so I can have a temporary escape Ooh. from the hurt inside that I'm not courageous enough to experience vulnerably. That's... <laughs> That's pretty deep. And I imagine if there's a bully listening to this, their eyes probably just welled up a little bit. <laughs> it's like, no, no, that's not going on. It, yeah, well, you can escape your tears as like leave a negative, hateful comment <laughs> right. uh, somewhere about what was just said. And, you know, online bullying. Yeah, that's a good way to escape yourself, too. <laughs> so, so when I think about this, I, I, I'm in agreement, I think, with most, most of what you've said so far. Um, it strikes me as very odd that this is the this is the system that we inhabit we we live in a system whereby showing love and kindness to others feels good and yeah. benefits us and you almost see something similar um in a marketplace where like a businessman oftentimes serve their customers purely out of a profit motive and they make kind of they kind of make the world a better place even though it's merged with their self-interest and i wonder do you how do you so one perspective of looking at this is to say, oh, wow, isn't that an interesting coincidence? There's another perspective, a spiritual or religious perspective, which says, no, that's the system's designed that way. Like there's a reason, you know, there's a, let's say there's a benevolent God or something that created the system so that it would be that we get rewarded when we're, you know, loving or we feel better. What do you think about those ideas? Do you think that that's true? Do you think that's plausible? Yeah, oh, I definitely think it's possible. Um, in, 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 in a way, it, it seems like part of the quote unquote system is set up where we are rewarded with gratification for doing good to others. And, you know, honestly, I, I think humans were ridiculous enough that we need that. You know, you look at a, a child when they do, you know, a four year old does something nice, mom and dad will praise them. Oh, you did good, mm -hmm. which reinforces the good behavior because we need that. Like we're also savage monkeys mm -hmm. uh, capable of a lot of ruthlessness. We pretend like we're not because I, I would guess most people listening to this show are like inherently like great people who aren't out like inflicting violence on other people and probably not even emotional violence. But we're all capable of that. Like mm -hmm. welcome to the... Uh, a reminder, we are savage monkeys as well. So I think it takes training to harness our primal power hmm. so that it, we're, we're not reverting back to, you know, 2000 years ago when we're, you know, sorting each other to death so I can take your fruit tree and have mm -hmm. your horse or you looked at me wrong. I mean, we're, we are capable of that. And a mm -hmm. lot of, I mean, that's still acted out in the world. It just, I mean, the folks listening to this are probably, again, not acting out so savagely. But I do think we need training mm -hmm. and guidance to essentially act well rather than acting mm -hmm. savagely. So, yeah, it, and I think also the the system is set up in a way where it can reward people in the short term for using people. I mean, we all know people who mm. have made a lot of money at the expense of other people. Mm -hmm. I think long term, that person pays the price. But short term, they can have, uh, you know, monetary rewards. But I think, you know, we all know the saying slow and steady wins the race. Mm -hmm. So if we pretend that's true, I think when a, a business person is genuinely offering a product or service, that helps people and helps the world, even if it's to a small degree, uh, long term, they're going to be way better off, mm -hmm. you know, short term, they might not get as much growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could go cut the rainforest down and like make maximum profit for a few years. Right. But long term, that's not going to work for them, it's right. especially when people start to catch scent of their reputation, what they're right. really doing. Exactly. So <clears throat> do you see this? You said it take. you think it takes some training. Um, in order for humans to kind of overcome their primal um, instincts. Do you see the society, humans in general, as moving towards a particular uh, point of getting 
not enlightened is not the right word, but be, becoming more peaceful, becoming more loving, kind of overcoming some of those apish tendencies. Yeah. Do you see it going that direction, or, or do you do you even think it? Do you think it matters? Yeah, this is one I'll definitely say I don't know, but I definitely like to think so. Mm. Uh, that, and that just that might be me being delusionally optimistic. Uh, I've heard it said before: the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. They're equally delusional, except an optimist is happy about it. So I, that <laughs> might be at play here. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think the savage, uh, primal, just ruthless energy uh, is it, it's very much at play present day, certainly our wars and violence. But mm. also, I think it's being expressed a lot psychologically present day. Uh, whereas maybe 2000 years ago, it was just like more obvious because it's expressed physically. Mm. So hmm. even with that acknowledged, uh, I do like to think that we're evolving, uh, if you will, in mm -hmm. a, to a more loving society. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's not true, then I at least feel a little bit more peaceful inside pretending that's true. But I'm curious <laughs> from your perspective, uh, if you were answering the same question, what's your view on that? My guess is yes. Uh, I do think that, so I have to put it in some kind of um, religious context. And I say that, unfortunately, just because my background is this rationalist philosophy. Um, and so when I, I had this love experience, I had to expand my worldview. I thought, okay, I, I think I have enough evidence to say God exists and that love is something that is the meaning of life, the purpose of existence, like that's the truth. Um, and in those contexts, when you blend the two together, I think that in the long run, maybe a hundred years from now, maybe 50 million years from now, I don't know, love will win. I think it is, a, it is so superior. And when people bump into it, um, they're going to recognize this as, oh, this, this is where it's at. This is powerful enough to structure our lives around. Now, the, the trouble is when I say that, um, uh, one is people aren't going to be persuaded because it's not a rational argument. And I totally understand that. But two, love is this ambiguous word, which I'm finding I can't even I, I can't even use anymore because people think I'm talking about just an emotional feeling, and that's not really what I'm talking about. Like you can feel love, yes, but the love isn't the feeling. There's that's the feeling sure. of the love, and I don't exactly. It's something like a bond or a connection, or I don't exactly know what it is, but I know it's not just purely the feeling. So I'm not saying we're all going to be like love addicts as if it's a drug like cocaine you know it's like oh yes the feeling of love is the meaning of life i don't think that's the case but i do think and this is what I, all the religion well most of the religions we're talking about is when you when you experience that thing whatever you want to call it love or god or truth you want to expand it you want to show other people it and i think if there's enough people that can do that for long enough, maybe it's the delusional optimism. I think it'll win out because I think it's just mm -hmm. so incredibly superior. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too, uh, says this guy's humble opinion. <laughs> so I want to ask you then, since I, I, I sometimes um, I, I, there's a mixture of my audience between kind of religious people or people who are very much anti-religious, um, I'm sure. so, yeah. Sounds like a divisive crowd. <laughs> well, it is, yeah. Uh, I wonder, you, you did a video called, um, I think, is it How to Be an Atheist? Something yeah. like that? Yeah. And it, it satirizes uh, what you might call dogmatic atheism, that yeah. those that, that are totally convinced that um, there is nothing beyond the the five senses, everything is certainly physical. And if you just suggest otherwise, you suggest that, that there's a God, it is equivalent to you saying you believe in magic fairies. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what, what do you think about that? Why did you do that particular video? Yeah, I, I find um, a lot of us, uh, when we become, when we psychologically become rebellious and defiant, uh, you know, we're being defiant to something, in this case, religion uh, with dogmatic atheism. I tend to believe when we're acting from that defiant, rebellious place psychologically, we become exactly mm. what we're being defiant against mm. and are blind to it. 
which I think is hilarious. Freaking wasps are trying to get me again, Steve. Uh, <laughs> so you, one of the purposes of the video is to uh, create the invitation for awareness of, uh, mm. hey, are you being exactly what you're uh, rebelling against, mm-hmm. just expressing it a little bit differently? Mm-hmm. I think the same thing happens with spiritual people who consider themselves uh, beyond religion and, you know, dogma of religion, man, that's so wrong. So it's like, okay, now you're dogmatic about being uh, dogma free. Right. So can you see how you're losing yourself while you think you're finding yourself? What, yourself? So, but I think if someone comes from a much, uh, uh, what I would call a more mature adult perspective in their psychology and says, yeah, atheism for me, I choose this because of these reasons. Mm-hmm. That's very different than be becoming an atheist because you're becoming de- because you're defiant against mm-hmm. religion. So anyway, that, that's what, what that's about. I, I find it amusing how it, me included, a lot of us will become exactly what we're rebelling against Mm -hmm. and be blind to it. Yes, I see it all the time. And one of the words that has now, I can't use anymore, although I do, is skeptic. Yeah. Like, so for me, my disposition is extreme skepticism, like self-skepticism, like if I'm dogmatic, it is the method of skepticism where I'm not even sure an external world exists. Like that's the position I'm comfortable from. But that term now doesn't reference a kind of default to doubting particular claims, doubting that what the knowledge we have is true, that now is like a, a social signaling word that implies you have a particular belief system about yeah. materialism, you know, the irrationality of religion. Uh, uh, there's, there's like a set of beliefs. There's literally a skeptics movement, which is the, the exact opposite of what skepticism is about. For sure. It's actually, I was, uh, there, there is um, a podcast I did. It was, um, the, I forget the exact name of it, but they were the skeptics. Mm-hmm. And that was the whole theme. And, and uh, you know, I shared my idea of like, well, if you're a true skeptic, you should be skeptical about whether or not you should be a skeptic. Like, mm-hmm. can, can you even do that? And I do believe that, I don't know, it, it's like, I, I think our, this is my delusional opinion. I think our life energy serves us better when we put it behind what we stand for Mm. rather than always crusading against what we don't stand for. Mm. And I think the challenge of becoming a religious, you know, religious about our skepticism, as you point out, is we're always crusading against what we don't stand for. Mm -hmm. And then I think eventually we need to ask ourselves the question, well, can I have enough sense of self to figure out like, what do I stand for? Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't stand for all this. It's like, yeah, well, who are you and what do you, what do you stand for? Can you have enough courage to stand for something? And can you have enough courage to change your mind and let it grow and evolve? Hopefully. So I think a lot of people bleed their power uh, bleed their power out when they're just crusading against what they don't stand for. Mm -hmm. And I think we reclaim a lot of our power when we actually stand for something that we believe in. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just purely intellectually, skepticism is much easier than uh, posi- making positive claims because it's a thousand <laughs> times easier to poke holes in an argument in which there are inevitably going to be holes than to create an argument that is you try to make you know whole proof it's way yeah. way way harder for sure it, it's just like it's way easier to sit in the football stadium watching the game than it is to <laughs> right. be on the field playing it's like yeah you can criticize peyton manning because he had an incomplete pass but guess what? Now you get on the field right. and you, uh, you know, take action. You get yourself in the gladiator arena rather than being in this convenient comfort zone called uh, uh, an onlooker. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't necessarily know that all kind of by trade skeptics are only the convenient onlooker, yet I think a lot are. Oh, yes. Um, okay, so the last question I want to ask you, just be pretty straightforward because a lot of people are interested when you when you 
open yourself up to the idea that there is some truth to be found in spirituality and perhaps even some profound truth. That also can be a rabbit hole because people will take that and then they'll sometimes construct really wonky belief systems about how the universe exists only for them and like the, or they're the only thing that exists and they're certain of it and they, they there's a there's this idea of the law of attraction which i'm sure you're familiar with which um you know which essentially says the universe exists to serve your purpose i don't think that's the case um do you have something to say about that yeah uh, i agree i think it's a very ego-based interpretation of like the law of attraction to say like i control the universe right. it's like that's the magical mind of the a child thing it, like that's literally a phase of thinking yeah. we go through when we're two years old yeah uh, when we think the world revolves around us we make things happen but guess what we're a speck of dust on top of a bigger speck of dust right. uh, so in other words I don't think we control the universe uh, I think that's incredibly gratifying to our ego to think we control the universe and uh, it's it's uh, sort of a two-year-old psychology, in my opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in the context, then, what do you think does control the universe, if anything? Do you have a positive belief in the existence of some kind of a God, creative force, structure of the universe? What Are you, are you comfortable answering that? Yeah, it's a great question. I, and my question won't at all pretend like I've got some kind of all-figured-out plan do I believe in a God? Yes. Uh, not the, not a human God, like mm. we're we human, humanized God, some right. dude up there, gray beard, white guy, of course. Right. Uh, I, I think <laughs> God in the sense of there is something very significant beyond me. Mm. Uh, I, mm. uh, and, and, and so what's, God's control or what's controlling God and oh, uh, how does God create control the universe? What's the, I don't know. I definitely don't know. Um, though I can say, eh, I, I believe there is a higher power, but mm -hmm. yeah, the idea of uh, what's controlling the universe. And some would say, you know, that the word universe is synonymous with God. Mm -hmm. Man, that's a mystery. Mm. I'm curious if you have the secret, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the answer to that secret. Right? Oh, sure. Yeah, no, I've solved it all. No, uh, um, I, I tend to agree. Uh, so the way that I put it is in the skeptical context. I have my criteria for skepticism about the existence of God. That threshold has been met. Um, and it's and I would say if anybody experienced love is the way the word that I'm using. If you've experienced that state of being you will have enough evidence to conclude ra purely rationally that there is something bigger. There's something more, there is, um, there is um, a different level of fulfillment when you can get in um, the love state of mind. Now, for me, this came from experience. Like, uh, you know, I could put it in a, in a ha half mocking, half completely true way that it was as if God spoke to me personally. It was like, hey, by the way, Steve Patterson, here's the experience of love, and I love you, and it's a pretty big deal. And it, was, it kind of was sort of what happened, if I would summarize it. Um, for you, do, with those beliefs, does that, do those, did that come from experience? Did that come from contemplation, from reading, from why do you have those beliefs? Yeah, I think they, they first came through um, reading. So they first came intellectually and particularly there's a book called Conversations with God, book one by Neil Donald Walsh. It, it's really like a, a philosophical book and it really like everything that was, not everything, but a lot of what was said in there. It's like, wow, I was having the sensations like I've always believed this. I just haven't known I believe this. Mm. It's like a, almost mm. a remembering. Mm. And then I think it, it's taken me um, longer to embody the kind of that intellectual belief and have like a feeling sense of 
connection. Mm. Like it, almost like maybe I'm on imbi- via an umbilical cord that I can't see or feel mm. connected to something greater than me. Mm. Uh, hard to describe, but that's that would be the the way I feel it now mm. after. And I think I needed my mind trained to like l- look for this a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I like the analogy with the umbilical cord. That was kind of similar to the experience I can- occasionally bump into, and pretty much without question, maybe with a, a few exceptions, it is when I am in the loving state of mind, which is not Steve Patterson's loving state of mind. Like I, I'm kind of a cold guy. Um, but that's where I feel like whatever that is, whatever the thing that we seem to be connected to is, and it can be kind of expressed through us, it comes out in a loving way, you know, or it is the love or something like that. Do you have the same type of experience? Yeah, you know, kind of that reminds me of uh, the terminology of like, maybe we're all vessels, mm-hmm. uh, you know, here letting something larger than us live through us. Mm. And I think similar, like a tree, lets something larger than it live through it. It lets the earth live through it. And then mm. like the tree coursing through the sap, I think is the the literal expression of the earth, you know, what's bigger than the tree living through it. So mm. um, yeah, I, 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 I kind of think that's how it is with us. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on, uh, a high note. I really appreciate the conversation. Uh, this has been great. Oh, for me too, Steve. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been very delightful talking with you, brother. Likewise. All right, that was my conversation with Mr. J.P. Sears. I hope you guys enjoyed it. How about that? There is some deep thinking underneath the surface of this satirist. We got to speak a little bit before this interview and a little bit after the interview, and he really is a nice guy, so I wish him the best of luck as he continues his rise to internet stardom. And I just found out after we spoke... Turns out JP is a college dropout himself. Go figure. All right, guys, that's all for me this episode. Have a great week.